Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of our Dear Earth gathering. I am happy to see you all. And we are here for a, a beautiful time together with Heber Brown and Tim Van Meter titled Beautiful Journeys, Back to Earth, Land, and Justice. Before we get started, I would like to ground us and invite us into a time of centering. So if you can make contact with the feet, uh, if you can make contact with um, the floor beneath your feet uh, or your seat, and just imagine uh, the way that the foundation underneath you goes down to the earth, maybe directly through the floor or maybe through many stories, down, 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 you are connected to the ground. And if it feels okay to you and you'd like to close your eyes, do so. Yeah. And into your mind's eye, bring the last piece of nutrition that crossed your lips. If you wanna imagine holding it in your hand, maybe you are now holding it in your hand. And imagine if you will, where this food traveled from to get to you, this food or this beverage. For me, it's a nice dark cup of Sumatran coffee. And so I'm imagining all the networks and structures and systems Imagine all that happened in order to bring that last piece of nutrition to your body. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And on the in-breath, experience gratitude. And on the out-breath, acknowledge grief. Every bit of nutrition that we receive these days. Comes with both gratitude and grief. Give thanks for the nutrients and the hands of the laborers who bring nutrition to our body. And we grieve all the ways that the earth is broken daily by the systems and structures that bring it to us. And we acknowledge with gratitude all the new ways and ancient ways that are healing and whole our backyard gardens, our community gardens, where we buy radishes from the farmer who grew them or sell radishes to the people who eat them. With this sense of grief and gratitude holding hands, I invite you to come back to this beautiful group of faces on the screen in front of us. And allow me please to introduce you to two friends. Reverend Dr. Heber Brown is a catalyst for personal transformation and social change and has been doing that work for more than 20 years. For 14 years, he served as pastor of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Baltimore, where he personally experienced the impacts of food apartheid. He started a community garden in his church yard where elders taught how to grow and eat healthy local fruits and vegetables. And this inspired him to launch the Black Church Food Security Network, which advances food security and food sovereignty by co-creating Black food ecosystems. This is anchored by more than 250 Black congregations in partnership with Black farmers and other food justice stakeholders. Heber serves on the board of Bread for the World and has received numerous awards, including an Ashoka Fellowship for Changemakers and the Locke Innovative Leaders Award. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Nothing More Sacred, Radical Stories of Black Church Food, Faith, and Freedom. Heber is the loving father of two boys and many fig trees. 
<laughs> that's where I usually see him <laughs> is out um, harvesting from his garden. And I'm sure he's happy to be with us this morning and he will move directly to that garden as soon as he finishes with us today. <laughs> Heber, thanks for being with us. Dr. Tim Van Meter is Associate Professor of Methodist Theological School in Ohio, where he leads ecology and justice specializations. He is the director of a grant program leading pastoral and lay education, exploring climate change, anti-racism, trauma-informed responses, and possibilities for resilient communities. In 2023, he led a six-week educational engagement with young adults exploring the intersections of food sovereignty, anti-racism, climate change, and complex challenges of constructing hopeful vocation and hospitable, resilient communities. He'll tell you more about what he's been up to, but he's been joining us this week. He's a longtime friend of the REA and will be uh, joining, he's joining us from the shores of Lake Superior where his two siblings will be camping out with him for the next week. And I believe there are some important dogs in his life, but I'll leave that up to, to you, Tim, to introduce them to us. Thank you both friends for being with us and leading us into a beautiful journey where I expect grief and gratitude will both be called forth. Good morning and thank you, Dory, and thank you to the REA community for the opportunity to be a part of this morning's gathering. Well, it's morning for me. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it's all times of day for many of you who are watching at this time. And I wanna thank you for making the sacrifice to join in no matter the hour uh, that you're in at this particular moment. As Dory said, I am grateful and blessed to be the founder and executive director of an organization called the Black Church Food Security Network. Uh, this organization's home base is in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States on the east coast of the country. Uh, but we stretch far beyond our home base. And I'll be talking about that in a few moments. I'm going to share about the Black Church Food Security Network, and as I'm talking about the work of the organization, I feel inspired this particular morning to also talk about my journey and my growth uh, alongside the growth and the journey of the organization, for the two in many ways are intertwined. Uh, I'll share my screen and get right into it. As Dory said, this organization um, started in the context of me serving as the pastor of the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore. And I am what's called a preacher's kid. And when I was called to the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church, I was coming straight from under the wing of my father, Bishop Heber Brown II, who still pastors our home church and has been pastoring for well over 35 years. And so leaving from him to go to pastor the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church, despite me being a preacher's kid, I learned so much about the reality of living and sitting in that role and in that space for myself and not just watching from close distance. And so the story of the Black Church Food Security Network uh, really begins with my time pastoring this congregation. This is an aerial view of the neighborhood. And in the bottom right corner of this picture, there's a yellow circle. That yellow circle is over top the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church where I served. And while pastoring there, I observed and paid attention to a cycle of members of my church being hospitalized. And as many religious leaders do, when our members are in distress or, or are facing health challenges, we go and extend ourselves in some kind of way. And that's exactly what I did. I would go and visit with the members of my church while they were in the hospital. And I would go to pray with them, to give them encouragement, 
uh, to just be present with them in the midst of their ailment and or suffering. And many times in those settings, I had the opportunity to engage them in conversation about some of the most delicate, sensitive, and confidential aspects of their lives. They shared with me, many of them during those conversations, why they were in the hospital or why they were suffering or why they were sick from their vantage point. And I began to notice a thread amongst the people I would go to visit. And the thread was that food was somewhere in the picture contributing to their hospitalization and their ailments. And as I heard this theme and pattern of food, and really not just food, but lack of access to nutrient-rich food, lack of agency over their food environment and the like, my brain went into overdrive around how do we, how could I do something to help address the challenges I was facing, that I was hearing from those I was going to visit. Surely I gave prayer and surely I read scriptures. Yes, I provided as best I could spiritual encouragement, but I had a hunch, a curiosity, perhaps a desire even more so that I wanted to do something in addition to those things to address the root cause of why people who I loved and pastored were suffering. And so I still remember the day when I came back from the hospital from visiting a member of the church and I had the idea to cross the street to go to a fresh food market where, I don't know, I wanted to explore a partnership of some kind. And that fresh food market is on the screen in front of you in the top left corner of the picture. Do you see how close it is to the church? The church is in the bottom right. The market is in the top left. It's right over the intersection. And I still remember walking over to the market one day, walking inside the market with the intention of speaking with someone about a potential partnership that could pipeline nutrient-rich produce from their market to our church and members and community. But when I walked in the market that day, I decided to look at the produce section and I looked at the price of the produce and what I realized was this produce was very, very expensive. I knew that it would be difficult for me and the members of my church to purchase this produce in any consistent and regular way. And I also noticed that the, the environment of the uh, market was one that was not necessarily culturally aligned with my community. It was clear that this market was not designed with me and my community in mind. I noticed the economic barrier. I noticed the cultural obstacles and barriers. And I was discouraged from speaking to anyone in the market. It discouraged me from exploring a partnership in light of the barriers that I saw. Unbeknownst to me, when I crossed that street and that intersection on that day, I had crossed a red line in Baltimore City. There was no sign that said red line. There was no billboard. There was no one standing on the corner with flyers and posters to say, warning, warning, you are about to cross a red line. There was nothing there. But that market and its placement right next to a community of people who were in dire need of nutrient rich food, that experience let me know that I crossed the red line. Now, for some of you, that's a familiar term, but for others, perhaps you've never heard that term before, red line. Here in the United States in the 1930s, the government led and launched an initiative to map major cities in the nation 
and identify the places that were best positioned based on their metrics, best positioned for investment, for housing and quality schools and plans made for the best jobs and businesses, those places that were mapped on this government-sponsored map were green areas. These were the places where investment would flow, where attention would be given, where federal and local governments would give the best of what they had available in terms of resources and political might. But the green areas were not the only places that were mapped. There were also red areas on the map. And the red areas were the places where the government and business leaders decided there would be, there would not be high levels of investment. These were not desirable places to live. These were not places where there would be resources that would flow to improve the quality of life. These maps were established beginning in the 19, early 1930s. And these red areas on the map eventually came to be known as red lined areas. These red lined red zones on the map were places that helped to uplift and prop up racial segregation, that helped to lift up and prop up white supremacy and racism. And the ripple effect of those decisions in the 1930s also has a connection to food because the red zoned areas on the map also were the places where resources would not flow to prop up and or support uh, opportunities for residents to be in close proximity to their own food environment and nutrient rich food sources. Many black communities were placed in these red zone, red lined areas. And though these maps were established beginning in the 1930s, the ripple effect of those government and business decisions then still impact us to this very day. What you're seeing on the screen, when you look at the intersection before you, unbeknownst to me at the time when I crossed the street, this intersection marked a boundary in the red line of Baltimore City, Maryland. I had crossed an individual line, I'm sorry, an invisible line where people had made decisions long before I was born about where nutrient rich, healthy, good food would be. So based on the experience in that market that day and being discouraged about the idea of pursuing partnership any further, I walked out of the market be before I talked to anybody. I walked out. I was too discouraged and upset to even consider ways to partner with this market because I was frustrated that what the people needed in my church was so close and yet so far away at the very same time. So I walk back to my church, I get near the front door of our congregation. And when I get near to the front door of the church, I feel like I had an epiphany, like God grabbed my attention and made me look at a piece of the front yard near our front door. It's a piece of yard that I'd seen many times and it looked like this. I walk past this scene so many times every day as I pastored this church. The church owned the left side of this, this property, the house and the yard there with the green grass, the church had owned for decades. And this space had no ongoing purpose, utility or functionality in the life of our church. The right side of this photograph at the time that I took it was privately owned by an elderly gentleman. And he was so tired of cutting his grass that he paid a dump truck to come dump rocks and stones all over the grass. I had seen this scene hundreds, if not thousands of times before, but on this particular day with divine discontent bubbling up inside of me, God showed me a vision. God showed me a vision of us using the land that we had to grow the food that we needed. 
And basically the caption to this visionary picture in my imagination that day said this, if you cannot afford what they have, roll up your sleeves and grow it yourself. And so I went into my congregation, I started sharing with them the idea of us growing food on the land that we already owned outright. And many members of the church joined and got excited about the idea. But if I'm gonna tell the whole story, most people nodded and smiled, but did not show up to help. <laughs> but the remnant, the small group of members that caught hold to that vision, we worked together and we started a garden on this land. The elderly gentleman who lived on the uh, opposite side of the gate here, he made good on a promise. He gave us the first right of refusal. He said if he ever would move, he would give us the first chance to buy the property. And so he made good on that. We bought that property and it really helped our gardening plans even more. With that small remnant of people from a congregation of maybe 125 total, we worked together to transform this scene into this. We started growing food on this land. Dory talked about radishes. We grew some of that. Broccoli and kale, tomatoes. We grew herbs. Eventually, we got to the place where we started learning more about making our own tinctures and using herbs to help provide healing to our bodies. This garden provided the food that we needed at an impressive clip. It's just 1,500 square feet, but it started to produce about 1,200 pounds of produce per growing season. And more than just production of food, the garden provided a safe space and perhaps an additional sanctuary, not only for the members of our congregation, but also for the members of the neighborhood. There were people who did not necessarily embrace a Christian identity and had pretty uh, valid critiques of the church that kept them far away from the church building. But when it came to this land, it felt more welcoming. It felt like a place where everybody could come. There is a gate around the front of this garden, but we never put a lock on the gate. We wanted it to be from the very beginning, a true community garden. I can't tell y'all how blessed I was when sometimes driving past the church on the way to meetings or on the way uh, to other obligations, I would drive past and just look over in the garden to just take a peek to see how things were doing. And I would see people congregating, sitting, meditating, praying in the garden who I had no idea who they were. And while that made some of my church trustees nervous, that made my heart smile. That's what I wanted. I wanted people to see this as a welcome space for all. People started to donate and leave donations of tools and money to help the garden grow and flourish. It became a meeting space, a safe space, not just a production space. And one of the people who really was primary behind this whole effort is a woman who I will talk about for the rest of my life, Sister Maxine Nicholas. We call her Mama Maxine or Aunt Maxine. Maxine Nicholas grew up in the South here in the United States, in North Carolina, and she grew up on a farm with about eight brothers and sisters. She grew up in close proximity and relationship to the land. She grew up growing food. She grew up in an agrarian community that lived at a different pace and rhythm of life, oftentimes very different than the fast pace of the urban city experience. So when I stood up that day and I said, church, let's start a garden, it was Sister Maxine who really was the one who took the vision, the idea, the words, and led the way in manifesting. She became the portal through which we experienced God's presence in our midst on this land, in our space. And we all, me included as the pastor, became her mentees. We became, became under her tutelage as we learned from her in this space. She passed away in 2017, but the fingerprint that she left on the space still impacts us to this very day. And what I realized was that this 
dynamic of a church with a little bit of land and people who knew what it was to live in close proximity and relationship with the soil and with the earth, these were not unique just in my church. Many other churches have the same thing, a little bit of land, a remnant of people, and some kind of familiarity, some kind of interest, drive, curiosity about living in closer proximity and a healthier rhythm and frequency with the earth. And so I have the idea to think about all of the assets of churches across the country, parking lots, kitchens, land, vans, classrooms, and more, and put it together and say, man, a lot of this stuff sits underutilized Monday through Saturday. Why not find sacred use for it throughout the week? And that helped to get the ball rolling for this idea it sent me into my history books, and I'm a history nerd. I love studying history, and I go into history to get clues about how I and we can show up today and perhaps what, even what we can dream about the future. And I started meeting all of these sacred ancestors, these dynamic religious leaders who in their own ways found creative, innovative, dynamic, and encouraging ways to have their congregations, ministries, and organizations have a land-based, agrarian, food-based, soil-based aspect. People like Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, pictured in the top left of the corner, or organizations, social groups like the Black Panther Party, pictured in the bottom right at the free breakfast program they started for children. I went back in history and I found some highway signs, some markers, some tips as to what I could do and what was possible with the garden that we had started. And with all that together, we established the Black Church Food Security Network. It's We co-create Black food ecosystems anchored by Black churches in partnership with Black farmers and many accomplices from all backgrounds and stripes. And so what we do is we try to look for ways that these Black church spaces can bend their privilege bend their assets, bend their status and, and power, institutional power into the various aspects of a food system. So for some churches, like the church I pastored, production made the most sense. We had a little piece of land and we had farmers in our congregation. And so growing food made, made the most sense. But I also knew that that would not be the front door for every congregation. For other churches, perhaps Preparation and consumption would be the primary thing that they would give their attention to, maybe because they had nutritionists in their congregation. So you really had to tap into the spiritual gifts, the intellect, the creativity, and the genius of the people in the congregation, but I knew it could be done. So we went around sharing and spreading the good news about the Black Church Food Security Network and inviting congregations to come into community, because if we ever were going to achieve ever going to confront and change the impacts of redlining, the impacts of racism in the food system and other inequities and injustices committed against the planet and her people, I knew that we had to work together. The corporations are too big. Multinational businesses that govern everything from the sale of seeds to what's in the soil to now even trying to claim right to water and air. I knew that if this Goliath was ever going to be challenged, then David would have to bring all her stones together. And so the work of the network took on that kind of collaborative, collective shape from the very beginning. Here are some of our uh, primary programs, and I'm I'm about to go ahead and sit down and turn it to my brother and comrade, brother Tim. But our program, our first program is Operation Higher Ground, where we just help churches grow food on the land that they have. And listen, we are clear that church and community gardens by themselves cannot feed entire cities and communities. It's not about scale. It's about spirit. It's about inspiration. These church gardens become demonstration sites, not just for the growth of food, but also for the growth of people and their relationship with the land and soil. And this is what I learned, and Tim will love this. I learned that if we could just get people's hands in soil, it would do something to ignite and animate something within them 
that went far beyond just growing food to consume for yourself. Something would get into better alignment. Think about it like a spine in the human body. I have, I have literally witnessed the ways in which people getting their feet literally grounded, like Dory led us in the, at the beginning, if they get grounded in soil, something turns on on the inside that I believe God placed there. And it's like a honing beacon. Come home, come home, come home. And so the church garden spaces are places for, for revival, are places for resurrection in the spirit of the people who dare come out to the land. And so I love it when it happens in our children. And I love this picture because these children are eating strawberries straight from the patch for the first time in their lives. And considering their age, their taste buds have an imprint now about these strawberries grown on land that will stay with them for the rest of their lives as a point of reference and perhaps a point of sacred memory that will call them back to the land in their own journeys, in their own ways. But these garden spaces also become places for resistance. This picture is taken in Buffalo, New York, shortly after a massacre that happened inside the only grocery store in this black community in Buffalo. This massacre where a racist white supremacist walked inside a grocery store and randomly started killing black people as they were getting food in the store broke the hearts of this entire community and many throughout the nation. This community suffered more than once, not just from the massacre, but also because this was the only grocery store in their community. It meant that after, even after the massacre day, when the grocery store was shut down as a crime scene, the people in this neighborhood had to find somewhere else to go to get their food. And they called me because they said, we have churches. We have land at these churches. We wanna grow our food because we never wanna be in a position again where a massacre can happen that disconnects us from agency over our own food environment. But we also have the soil to sanctuary market. It's like a farmer's market featuring black farmers and black businesses. We do it we like to do it on Sundays right after church because after service, everybody is hungry and we're all going to eat and take a nap, probably in that order. And so we figured out that if we bring a market to the church and let people get food straight from the market, let little children like Naima make their favorite vegetarian dishes for the members of the church, stand with people like Reverend Raphael Warnock at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is the historic church of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and do cooking demonstrations so that everybody can see what good food straight from the land tastes like, that it would really help to deepen people's relationship and association with the soil, with themselves, and uh, with the larger uh, climate and environmental concerns as well. And finally, we have a program called the ART Program, where we wanted to do more to help churches to connect with farmers in their community in an institutional level, not just an individual member's level. And so this is an example of that. You see that church in the background? That's one of the mega churches here in Maryland. It's called First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. They never knew that there was a farm directly across the street from their church. They had a health conference, invited me to be the keynote speaker to their health conference to talk about nutrition, health, and ways that they can get healthy food. And I dared to ask them on my keynote, do y'all know there's a farmer right across the street? They had no idea. And so I was a matchmaker and I brought the church and the farmers together. And now they are in relationship. The church buys from the farmers, but the farmers also receive the support of the members around labor, promotion, and so much more. This sacred relationship continues to this day. And it's that kind of pollinating. I think of myself sometimes as a people pollinator because I just love going to communities to connect them with each other better, help them see one another, help them see the farmers, get closer to land and come closer to this powerful united network of congregations, farmers, stakeholders and accomplices working together. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about the Black Church Food Security Network. 
And now you're in for a real treat from my dear friend and brother, Tim, who we'll all hear from now and then come back with questions and conversation, I believe. Tim, I want to pause for one minute. To, yes, let's see all of the shows of um, thanks and appreciation for what Heber just shared with us. And let's just take a few deep breaths, a pause to let all of that sink in. And I want to encourage you to use the chat to let these lovely people know that we are here and awake and alive. <laughs> Use the chat and maybe just drop a word or two that shimmers or sparkles for you from what Heber just shared. For me, it's just the word strawberry. <laughs> That's all I needed. That's all I needed today was the word strawberry. Um, invigorating, yeah, let's um, harvest some of the uh, moments of feeling in our body, whether it was goosebumps, whether it was a little bit of um, salivating right here in our neck. <laughs> Let's acknowledge that we are human beings and part of the earth and we have physiological responses to um, the, the words that were just shared. I teared up a few times. Um, soil as place, turning on a honing beacon by grounding in soil. It's like a spine. Thank you so much, Heber, for um, getting us started here today. And now, Tim, when you are ready, please take us on this journey. Thank you so much, Dory. Thank you, Heber. I, I would think that by now, I would remember the utter foolishness of trying to follow you. I, I, don't, I don't know why I did that again. Um, it's just spectacular. All I want to do is uh, have a conversation with you going forward with all that you brought to us and how beautiful it is and how beautiful your work continues to be. And I'm, I am very excited to hear the word forthcoming in front of the title of your book. I know what a, what an incredible um, journey, maybe sometimes slog that has been for you to put the words down. Um, you're, you're, such a, a brilliant speaker and um i know that for myself sometimes there seems to be something in my head that stops between my voice and my pen and uh but i look forward to reading your words um absolutely brilliant again and of course and wonderful and um, we share a we, we've uh heber's taught for us before he comes and speaks with us he's got some of the black church food security work is happening in Ohio. And so it's uh, really good to connect with you again and go forward. One thing I want to say before I get too much into this is um, on our campus, August 6th to 8th, on our campus will be the National Faithlands Gathering, where we will be um, holding a conference for folks who want to begin to think about how their church or faithlands might be more deeply connected to farmers and farming and agriculture and that kind of work. And so if you have some interest in that, um, August 6th to 8th, this will be an in-person conference. Um, it's being organized, organized by Steve Schwartz, who's the national director for the National Faithlands Movement. And so I wanna invite you all to kind of reach out to me if you want more information about that. And I can get you some things there. So I wanna talk a little bit about what's happening in my space at the, on the campus of the Methodist Theological School in Ohio. I also want to spend a little time um, just kind of playing around with some things as we think about uh, um, the uh, the work of this. Uh, oh, this is a response. As I try to find my cursor, but, um, and uh, so we're we're doing some work here on our campus. Here you see a picture that I took this spring as we were harvesting asparagus. Uh, currently, we have about seven farm interns, about eight or nine students who are working summer full-time on the farm along with a full-time farmer who has full benefits, a full-time farm educator with full benefits, a full-time farm-to-table chef. I promise you there is no institution in the country, educational institution, that has better food than we do. Um, yesterday, I was in conversation with our chef as he ordered um, uh, from friends of mine, Jesse and Chelsea at the um, Fox Hollow Farm Naturally, he ordered um, pork and lamb. 
we do uh, have proteins from a variety of things, but we buy our proteins from farmers. We know we know their their growing practices, and we go forward with that in relationship. We could have a deeper conversation around vegetarianism, veganism, and uh, that I might bring a little bit of that up. But um, for the most part, we are a place that believes that we're going to be in relationship with our with our farming friends and support them in ways that uh, allow us to go forward with the best and healthiest food possible. Right now we're going about 140 different, no, I think we're up to about 175 different vegetables, varieties on our on our campus. On uh, This year, I think we have about six acres in production. We have a total of about 12 and a half that could be in production. Um, our farm land occurs on both ends of our campus. We are centrally located in the midst of it. And it's one of the things we've done around this idea of how do we engage our work there. So I want to begin with a poem. For the last decade, I've taught a class on our campus called Grief, Reality, Hope, kind of the, um, the theological construction of hope in the midst of existential crisis. This uh, class came about in, um, in response to my students telling me, I'm getting ready to pull a border collie close to me so he stops working. And uh, sorry about that. He's going right. a little crazy. Um, there's a bicycle going by and they must be herded at all costs. But I teach a class on the grief, reality, hope. This arose because my students told me they couldn't take another class with me because it ended up being unable to sleep and kind of living in despair for, uh, for weeks at a time after talking about climate and climate change and food and food sovereignty and food insecurity. Um, the idea of uh, food uh, apartheid. Uh, or other aspects we might use about the intentional redlining of food within neighborhoods and, and some of the things that we cover in the midst of, uh, of this work. And so this particular poem is the one that I always frame the beginning of the class by Andrew Hudgens called In. When we first heard from blocks away the fog truck's blustery roar, we dropped our toys, leapt from our meals, and scrambled out the door into an Eden briefly fuzzy, we yearned to be transformed, Translated past confining flesh to disembodied spirit, we swarmed in thick smoke, taking human form before we blurred again, turned vague and then invisible in temporary heaven. Freed of bodies by the fog, we laughed, we sang, we shouted. We were our voices, nothing else. Voice was all we wanted. The white clouds tumbled down our streets, pursued by spellbound children who chased the most distorting clouds, ecstatic in the poison. And I think for this poem, in some ways, it frames our, our contemporary situation in the midst of where we are. I was one of those kids in this poem chasing after the DDT truck spraying for mosquitoes in my grandparents' neighborhood. And this is a somewhat generational, but I remember specifically just so excited to play in that fog and how exciting it was to do that. And I think this is um, in some ways a pretty strong metaphor for our current situation, that we're laughing, we're joyful, we're happy. We think we're in the midst of understanding where we are and, and going in that, but really we're existing in a way that is so out of relationship to where we could be in the world that the framing of, uh, of our lives and even when we think about sustainability is the idea of sustainability that is able to continue the comfort and the disconnection that we move forward. I was, I was playing around a little bit with the idea of the conference thing, which I love with dear earth, but I was wondering what if the earth wrote a letter back to us, dear humans, you know, I'm wondering like one of the letters I thought was, it might begin dear humans. We're just not at that into you. You know, we, we just, whatever you've been for us has not been what the design was from the creator from the beginning, the, the idea of exploitation. I wonder if what that letter might read that came back to us and for how we might live in response to the grief of where we are. And we heard really wonderful things. I've been in multiple sessions, as, as Marcus said, whenever we can remember to uh, the time change between here and where I am now and the different things. But um, the Woodley's talking about community and partnership and living within the land. And, you know, I think that the earth 
one of the things the earth would ask us to do is to not just decenter ourselves, but to understand that we don't play any significance in the overall balance of creation as it stands. Um, we could, and certain individuals do. I think I look to my, to my friend and brother Heber Brown and others within this room that we work towards that. But as a, as a species, we often place ourselves in resistance to the world around us. So the work that I began to talk about on MTSO's campus began when we began to think about our, uh, our connection to our own mission and, and work together. I taught a course in 2008 um, where we began once a month, it was on ecological religious education. For those, a few of y'all know this in the room, but for those of y'all who don't, um, my dissertation, um, I found a way to leverage a little money left over from a grant from the Lilly Endowment to take college students see kayaking in South Georgia. And we designed uh, an ecological religious education that um, together in kind of cooperative communal model of education to think carefully through poetry, through short essays, through the history of Sapelo Island, through the marshes and some of the areas that we explored through kayak to begin to think about our, our, our different place on the planet. And um, that model for religious became, became part of my first class that I taught on ecology at MTSO, where once a month we would walk campus and I would ask students, how does what we're doing on our campus live in relationship to the statements about who we are? How are we in how are we in conflict with those statements? How are we supporting them? Um, I might have been a professor who threatened to put sugar in gas tanks as lawnmowers went all around us to mow about seventy five acres of land. Um, uh, I guess there was at that time about thirty four acres of, of being mowed. Uh, we owned uh, seventy nine acres. We now own a little over 100. We bought some land near us. But to, to talk about how the growing of a monocrop stood in resistance to our desire to be a place that, of food and fellowship, that it stood in resistance to the idea of a sustainable mission, stood in resistance to the idea that we actually lived in a place. And we would walk and we would talk. And at that time, our uh, president talked about having an open door policy. And so I would tell students, if you want this to change, you need to take advantage of that and go and sit down with the president of the institution and talk about how we might be a different institution. And out of that, a couple of years, the farm developed uh, as well as some other commitments. These are some of the things we've done since 2008 when that first class took place. I'm not gonna read through all of them. Um, there's a number of things we continue to do, but I think importantly, what it's done more than anything is changed our relationship to our community we have a lot more connection with um, folks who are doing urban farming and rural farming in the area. Um, we, uh, I sit on the agroecosystems uh, executive board for the Ohio State University um, as, as one of their um, board members. Um, that's something that I don't know too many other theological folks or have the ability to do, but that came about because colleagues at Ohio State in the ag school uh, who are doing organics and other forms of, of uh, food systems, agriculture, um, talked about us having the shortest food chain in the state of Ohio. It's about 100 meters from our fields to wash to the kitchen. And our food in our dining hall is about 85% local humane organic from our farm and from about 14 to 18 farms within about 45 miles that we buy from. And uh, we shifted some of the economics of those farms that we buy from and that we sign contracts at the beginning of the growing season, pay half the contract, and then at the completion and delivery of the food, we pay the other half the contract. That gives them less exposure when it comes to growing things and doing that work and gives us an opportunity to kind of have a, an ongoing strong relationship with local farmers. One of the things our institutional farm could have done is undercut the very farmers we say we want to be in relationship with, and we don't want to do that. Um, we're, we've mo also moved, we, I mentioned the farm team, we also have a land stewardship team that's uh, 
taking out some of the invasives, uh, honeysuckle in particular and some others, reinstituting kind of a food forest areas in about 16, 17 acres of our campus, um, growing pawpaws and some other understory plants that will uh, both benefit the forest and the soils, but also benefit um, wildlife populations as well as the human beings growing that are, we are living there. And then some other things here. One of the things Dory mentioned that I just want to say briefly, and I, I don't want to go too deeply into it. I have had a, a, the privilege of, of leading some grants. I did leave the Lilly Pathways Endowment Grant in May. Um, not something I wanted to do, but it became, um, I had to make a decision of integrity. You have to determine how long you're going to let, um, let's just say, I, 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 that's all I need to say. This is being recorded and uh, it's, it's kind of an exposed position there um, with uh, uh, damaged people, damaged people. And I decided I did not want to be damaged any further. Um, from one of the members of our leadership. Um, but there's a lot of good things going on here. Heber, one of, I think one of the first places we met was at the Seminary Colloquy on Ecology, Race, and Religion, uh, where you came out and we began to talk about what that might look like. Just gatherings of people that were intentionally more people of color than white folks, more women than men, to try to shift the dynamics within those conversations. And myself and some of my colleagues, um, white male colleagues kind of, uh, committing to not be the first person to speak in the room, committing to not doing some things and allowing, Melanie Harris has participated in these, Christopher Carter, a number of other folks, and found them to be a rich and important part of that. So these are some of my own thoughts about what, what am I doing? How is this reshaping how I think about the work that I'm doing? What does it mean to be work in intersectional ecology? This fall, we'll, we will introduce uh, a new curriculum and I will begin to teach a one week intensive where about 30 people will be present on our campus and another 20 to 25 incoming students will be online. Um, and uh, for every incoming student in our master's program, they take an introduction to practicing echo theology. And it's a one week intensive. And these are some of the elements of that particular course to where every student who comes on our campus will understand here are our commitments. You don't have to commit to them, but here are our commitments. What does it mean to be anti-racism, anti-racist? What does it mean to be uh, to hold a place of of, uh, of welcome and and uh, honoring for folks, regardless of of their um, around human sexuality? What does it mean to, to worship and practice? Uh, and proclaim in relationship to places and people, what is dialogical knowing in relationship, not just with other human beings, but with our, our fellow creatures, and our fellow places of, of learning together. So these are some of the principles there. So I, I wanna, uh, I think I, looking at really quickly at my timer, huh, about halfway. So I wanna take a little bit more time just to say, I believe that we are an institution that probably does more and says less, and this is an opportunity to, to kind of brag a little bit, but I also want to say that every space held um, by faith communities, by educational institutions, um, by religious institutions, has the possibility of living in radically different relationship with their space and their place and their land even if it's along the lines of um, one of the uh, institutions of higher education, uh, a Muslim institution that determined they were gonna shift their relationship to food and just did like 18 inch beds along the sides of their buildings and grew things up the sides of their buildings because they wanted to shift and tear out the, tear out the bushes that were there, the decorative work that, then allowed some kind of productive space to, to feed themselves, but also to feed the birds and the other wildlife that were in their very urban environment. And, and part of what I enjoy doing is walking the land or walking the space with faith communities and with people who have a different vision and begin to imagine them. And I'm deeply appreciative of those opportunities. I also want to say one of the spaces this particular journey has taken me on 
is um, I find myself in a in a different space that I have been as I move towards my own shift in vocation um, in retirement. Um, this last, uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but this last December, I had a fall uh, off a very small step, but the step hit me in such a way where I tore my kidney, tore my liver, and was bleeding from my spine, and came within, the doctor said, about 12 hours of uh, not being with you all this week. Um, I do want to say that one of the people that uh, Heber and I share as a uh, someone we deeply love together, Dean Valerie Bridgman, probably saved my life during that time where she was the advocate for my two weeks in the ICU where she's arguing with uh, what it, with surgical teams who don't speak to each other. <laughs> and if you all have been in those situations, realize that our medical specialists are very concerned about their specialty, but they don't really care. You're just an object on... Uh, uh, a hospital bed very often and that was my experience and it was good to have her there as an advocate and others there too but one of the things that did for me was to begin to think about what are the lessons I have learned and what are the places I want to go forward into and one of the places that I think has brought us into a bit of relationship that we have to deepen within theological and religious education um and I'm surrounded by here is uh, how are we in relationship with folk that um, in the North American political situation, the U.S. political situation with people that I deeply disagree with and that have a very radical sense of, uh, of what I understand to have uh, a damaging political vision of the world. And um, one of the things that I've I've discovered over the last time year few years is that our my theological institution has very little connection with those folks within our education, where our students go out to be leaders within communities where they will engage those differences, and so we often find ourselves in our institution teaching and preaching and leading from a particular progressive vision of the world and not equipping our students for deep human relationship with people who have radical difference. We'll talk about that, but we don't necessarily do a lot of work around that. And um, what I've discovered and, and wanna to continue to spend more time doing is to just have the conversations I have with my neighbors. If, if you go to a campground, I promise you that most of your neighbors are voting for a person different than who you would vote for if you're from North America. In fact, you'll even see some flags. But, but to engage them in conversation just about what is their actual vision of the world? What are the things that they're afraid of? What are the spaces they want to live in a different place? Um, can I live out what it's here is number seven, this idea of wisdom grounded in humility with people that I am in radical difference with and to talk about their kids that uh to, to to respond to the little tester questions you'll get here where whether it be around pronouns or about human relationship or elsewhere to to do some deflection to tell the truth but tell it slant as we heard from Jennifer yesterday Jennifer Ayers and others in relationship with them and to be in that space and um and I'm, I'm not sure where that resonates with you all, but for me, um, I had a conversation after the 20, it was about 2017, 2018 with colleagues, with old friends in, in Atlanta, actually friends of friends, where they talked about a hope that, um, AI would so shift agriculture that it could get all those people out of the rural areas and move them into the cities so that AI and robots could grow things. And then those people could be educated into understanding the world the way they understood the world. And in that conversation, I said, that sounds like genocide. It 
sounds like a progressive vision of genocide. And, and it, it shifted my understanding of the work I do in that if the people who are named as those others, which are very often my friends and neighbors as I, I live a pretty rural life, are seen as other and less than, then what gospel am I living out? And um, so this is part of the conversation I want to hold. I'm holding up on the slides because they get worse <laughs> from here. That, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, we don't. This is a good one. So, so part of what I want to talk. So when I talk about this, who is invited, I need to shift my understanding of the people who I am in relationship as well as with, as well as the creatures. That who is invited? What does it mean to be advocates for? all people to have healthy food. Folks who live in um, redlined food neighborhoods in urban settings, in rural settings, in exurban settings, that very often don't have access to it. Heber, I don't know, one of the things I get when I talk about healthy food, and I, I think you might get this too, is there tends to come from a relatively privileged person. The question, the, the statement of, well, we can't talk about organic or healthy food because the poor people can't afford it. You know, poor rural people, poor urban people can't afford it. Which to me, the response is, why do you frame your vision of the world in such a way that people who need it the most can't have the healthiest food? And how do you wanna shift your relationship to those who grow it in such a way that if you do have the privilege of going to farmers markets, if you do have the privilege of being closely related to farmers, how do you wanna use that privilege in such a way that allows the, the, the healthy food that is important for you and your family to be shared with everyone? That's one of the reasons I respect Heber's work so deeply is he's on the ground doing that. And I wanna, I, I wanna be in relationship with him as he goes forward but to think about that in other ways too. So when I think about opening um, uh, places to, cons to construct space for life, I think that even though I talk a lot about food and food sovereignty, this is also, um, we have to be advocates for anti-war in such a way that talks about um, rebuilding a world afterwards where people have access to healthy food and healthy life going forward. We have to understand the importance of being advocates for children in the midst of this. All these things I think everybody here was committed to, but all of this in my mind is related to food and it's related to how we educate, how we think about the world. And, and we need to be doing that. So I, I live in, and work primarily in rural spaces. It's where I find myself feeling most at home. But I, I want, when we think about climate and climate change, and we think about it as the threat multiplier that it is, that everything we see on this list about constructing life, climate change will make harder, more difficult with fewer resources and, and how we might do that. I, I wanna keep certain images in mind that um, are, are tragic, but also involved, involve the outsourcing of violence um, to communities other than our own and sometimes within our own. I think many of you all are probably familiar with the work of Rob Nixon. The book's been out for almost uh, two decades now. And um, as he talks about this uh, outsourcing of violence on a, a temporal and geographical scale, that we, particularly those of us who live in Western cultures, it's not just that we want to live in such a way that allows us to begin to have sustainable practices. It, it, I think we have to face the understanding that our current way of life outsources violence to our children, our grandchildren, as well as to people around the world. That the, um, the um, spaces that we hold and the, the lives that we live with a level of comfort require um, sacrifice zones and the work of uh, Christopher Hedges and uh, and Joe Sacco that requires sacrifice zones that for us to live in comfort, others have to live in despair. And that we outsource the violence of our lives 
through that and to face that in such a way that it requires not just a repentance, but also a commitment to live with a different connection to our own comfort and how we might do that together. So I've got a few pictures here of, of, of our own work. This is, uh, this is uh, our campus this spring after we got hit by um, three tornadoes on our time and kind of ripped some stuff. This has been ripped put back together. And this is the, the reality of what it means to grow food in, in our new environment and live in that space. Um, this is just a brief graphic that kind of, you can locate yourself on this to help you understand when we talk about climate, when we talk about weather, we have different base points for how we think about it based on when we were born. When we talk about a cold winter with someone who was born after 1998, they have no concept of what a cold winter means to me who was born in 1960. Um, I have an argument with this graph because I'm not a baby boomer. I grew up in the backwash of the baby boom, but that's, uh, <laughs> I really think those of us who were born from like 1958 to 1964 should argue <laughs> this graphic because we didn't live in that, but, but what it means to have that baseline and what it means to live in rural agricultural world in, in a time of climate change. Um, this is also my backyard, um, the, one of the bomb trains that came through New Palestine, East Palestine, Ohio. Um, this is more pictures of our campus and, and what went down with the tornadoes. And I, I wanna close with this particular quote from Rebecca Solnit. I've come back to it again and again and again that the idea that the future is dark with a darkness as much of the womb as of the grave. And so what kind of world do we wanna live and give birth to together? Uh, in, in the midst of COVID, I got rid of and sold my house and got rid of about 90% of the stuff so I could live somewhat differently and, um, and be in a different relationship with the world as I move into the last stages of vocation and um, into the kind of eldership of my life. And I wanna invite other people to just let's have that space to where we reflect on what will it mean for us to reshape community during the time of our lives uh, that we have together to kind of give our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren um, space for a radical different vision of the world. And to be honest with you, uh, if, if we could create a world that somehow reflected like Becky Chambers Monk and Robot series or anything around those visions, I'm all for it. But what kind of world do we want to dream together? Where the earth might write us a different form of letter that says, thank you for actually living into human vocation in such a way that has allowed all of my create all of creation to thrive all of the creatures who live on this planet um, together. As Sally McFaig says, we are terrestrial. We can live nowhere else. So thank you all for this. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to let you all, I'm going to sit back and relax because uh, I think everybody needs to be asking Heber a lot of questions right now. So as soon as I can figure out where my cursor is, I promise you I'll get out of this. <laughs> While Tim is figuring out where his cursor is, uh, let's show him some gratitude for being with us today. We can always count on you, Tim, to bring us the sobering reality. And and I usually say that as a joke and I say it lightheartedly, but today I'm saying it in all seriousness and with gratitude. Thank you for bringing us the sobering reality as you see it today and as you have seen it for many decades and have been a prophet to us about what is on the horizon. So we thank you very much. And I'd like to invite people to do the same thing that we did with Heber, put into the chat a few words that are um, uh, reflecting what is resonant with you after being able to share Tim's reality and hear from his, uh, the resilience. Tim, I, I taught on Bethesda's campus many years ago, and I can testify to the transformation that has taken place there, like radical, radical change. And so if we don't believe that things can change, that is testimony that it can. 
And I also just want to mention um, while people are putting their words in the chat that um, I didn't know about your health help um, scare and that rush with mortality. I'm so grateful to our dear friend, Dr. Valerie Bridgman for advocating for you in a system that doesn't always take care of us well. So, so thank you for sharing that vulnerability. Dory, I, I, I want to let you know it made me even meaner. So be careful. Uh, when I have a health scare, I might be calling you. We all need good advocates at the bedside. So I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing some questions pop up and some comments um, from Jennifer Sanborn, live the different connection to our comfort. Mary, of course, loves the robot books. And maybe Mary, you'll put them in um, the chat so we know which robot books you're talking about. Um, appreciation from Reverend Sierra Marie, a question from Wanda, what would it look like to live into the fullness of our human vocation? Giving thanks for the book of life that you're writing in the land at Methesco MTSO, Jennifer here says. Deborah lift, lifts up the term faith lands. And Tim, if you're able, I would love a link to that in the chat. And Orla lifts up the beauty of eldering and honoring the dream of the earth. So I think the place I'd like to invite is for um, Hebert to have some words back at you um, and, and see if after that there is someone who wants to unmute and let us hear their voice as they ask a question that, that's on their hearts. I see a young one on the screen. Hi, Sophie, and who that young person is with you. Nice to see you. Um, so if that's okay, Heber, do you wanna speak back and then we'll let some questions arise. We have about 15 minutes for conversation. Certainly, and good morning. Hi, Jet. Um, I think that uh, we were joking a little bit before going going in, into this session. Uh, Tim talked about a hope sandwich. He said, "You know, you you go first, and I'll go with a little bit more of a weightiness to my message, and then we'll come back um, and bring lift the spirits a little bit at the end of the session." Um, but given what I heard. Um, I'm grateful for the hope in Tim's presentation. Now, it's in my view, it's a grounded hope. It's it's even perhaps an attempt, a pathway to hope. But for me, hope, hope nevertheless, hope nonetheless. Um, and that final quote there, I think, really helped to. Um, articulate well for me kind of through words what I experienced him through your through your presentation today is the darkness of the womb and the darkness of the grave and holding those side by side uh, really did something to my to my mind to my spirit I felt something and the kindred darkness of both the womb and the grave and perhaps even some kindred connection between what happens as you move through the darkness in both of those veins. There could be a way to think about it as being very disparate, disconnected and separate, but there could also be another way to think about the darkness of the womb and the darkness of the grave uh, being very similar in what happens next. And it makes me, uh, in this moment, sitting with the gravitas of your presentation, the, the grounded hope of it all, it makes me release, I feel, I feel physiologically, this Dory is speaking in my spirit. I feel in my body a release into what composting has taught me on the land. Mm -hmm. That as much as I am tossing into the compost pile what I would label as devoid of any value outside of anything nutritious anymore. It's waste, it's scraps, it's 
But if you let it pile up and tend to it well enough, long enough, then new life even comes from that which was once called waste. And I appreciate the grounded hope, the, the compostable hope found in clear eyed recognition of where we are and what is happening and a resolve to um, a way a way forward and as you beautifully said a leaning into a deeper and greater human vocation so thank you thank you for that and Heber I want to thank you also for all that you brought and you bring every time um, yes thank you for your I, I, uh, I think some of my favorite moments are like when I visited your church and we went to a couple farmers and had the conversations in the vehicle on the way out and, and the way back and also to be there and also walking our land together. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really want to, I don't want to dwell on the health stuff, but I do want to say one of the things that came out of that is I have no fear of death. Mm. Um, part of what I'm wondering if for many of us who are here as Christian people, what would happen if we actually believed resurrection? Mm. <laughs> and so we had a speaker on our campus uh, a year ago, spring, um, Dr. Ratan Lal, who's the most honored soil scientist in the world, um, speaks a lot with uh, Al Gore and some other stuff there. And he had this moment with an audience of about 75 folks, many of whom were pastors, where um, he said the quote that I put in the chat, and you saw sermons being written <laughs> as it was happening, because he said the rhizosphere, the root soil interface, is the only place that we know of in the universe which has the divine power to resurrect diet death into life. And so as we face this idea of a new reality, I don't just talk about food so we can feed people. Um, when you talk with Dr. Lal or uh, Vice President Gore or any of those folks, the soil, the place that we live through regenerative practice has the possibility of putting almost all the carbon we have placed in the atmosphere since the Second World War back into it, bringing that back into it just through radical commitment to making each growing season healthier and deeper and growing in ways that allow carbon to be put back into soil. Um, th this is a place where there's actually open and engaged scientific debate, um, but it's it's well worth it. So Heber, when you speak about this sense of compost, it, that quote came up immediately. And I, But I also think about um, just walk in one of the markets with you at the afternoon and watching the, the people responded well to your preaching. I don't want to say anything bad about your preaching. People responded well, but they really responded well to the sweet potatoes and some other stuff that was found in the market afterwards and how they were going to go home and, and make that. And it was a, it was a vision of kind of shared communal life as people thought about coming to table together in a way that, yeah, re remains a kind of a grounding metaphor for me. Thank you. I see um, Deborah Rinstra in the chat, who was our plenary speaker. I've lost track of days, y'all. Two days ago, saying what inspires me about both of you is the significance of starting small and discovering the assets and resources that are already there, connecting them and letting them grow. Um, and that certainly connects with her framework of refugia and corridors. Um, and as I read her book, um, Heber's work constantly came to mind in terms of the corridors, not just the small pockets, but how much given what is going to happen um, how important those corridors are and how important it becomes that we have allies and friends and new underground railroads. Um, that doesn't feel like a metaphor to me right now. It feels like a, um, like how are we being called forth into our roles as people on this, um, 
connected pathway of life. So don't let me start preaching here. Who else would like to come in and ask a question? I'm looking for hands or make a comment or show your gratitude or express your grief alongside these um, beautiful friends who've shared their hearts with us. If you are feeling so led, um, don't wait for me to see your hand. Just unmute and enter the space. Elizabeth Nolan, I've appreciated the, the presentations. I It reminded me of a, a very important experience. In 1983, outside the, the fence of Union Theological Seminary on Broadway, just north of 120th Street, I noticed some Asians collecting some of the weeds that were growing uh, very um, prolifically uh, just inside the, the fence. And I asked them what they were doing and they said, uh, this is good food, good salad. Uh, they didn't speak very much English. And I was amazed there in that, that city that for me was uh, concrete, and, and stone uh, and weeds was food. And I, I've since become so aware of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters here in Australia who um, can can gather food from the environment. And, uh, and I remember how some of our um, explorers, our Western explorers died because they did not know that the food was all around them. And so I give thanks for um, the rediscovery of Indigenous food and and the connection between land and, uh, and life. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are there others? I see your hand, Jennifer, go. It's so good to see you both and thank you for this. Um, mainly, I just wanna express my gratitude because I think that one of the things that I've grown impatient with in recent years is the are the arguments about pragmatism or practicality and what you both have reminded me and sort of reinforced that for me is that it's not just about the kind of quantity outcome, how much healthy food can we produce? It's not just about <clears throat> the um, measurable outcomes of the health of the soil. Sorry, I have a dog that wants to participate now. Um, <clears throat> but it's also about what happens, the internal transformation of what makes a good life. And the idea of like, it's like our spine, um, the, the quote, wonderful quote from Rebecca Solnit, Tim, that you offered. So I just want to offer my thanks for that uh, sort of reaffirmation. Thanks. And yes, it's nice to have this Rebecca Solnit thread. She showed up in our uh, in a photograph in our plenary last night around fire salons. Um, we have a question from Sophie Callahan wondering if the Faith Lands Conference is an annual event. Can either of you speak to that? Eber, you may have spoken at the last one. I'm not sure. I think it's been three years since the other last one. I think they're trying for every other. This is a group that's... Um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other folks involved and names are escaping me right now. Uh, Nuria um, Parrish, I think, uh, uh, some other folks. So Steve Schwartz, who uh, the interfaith co-op work that he does out in California is trying for every other year. This is the first time the conference has not happened in California. I know that. And so it'll be on our campus. Um, please follow up with the website. I did put it in there. And um, and be in contact with Steve, and I'll try to get 
any connection, but I think every other year is their goal. Great. And Deborah, um, I see that you're on screen now. Would you mind telling us more about Niraya Love Parish of Plainsong Farm? Oh, hi, everybody. Yes, it's so great to be here. And I'm just so grateful for this session and so inspired by it. Um, yeah, Nuria founded Plainsong Farm, which is here in Michigan, um, oh, a while ago. And she's just retired from the farm, although it's still very much operating. But she, when she, she had this vision to form a faith-based farm, uh, she was really surprised to find that there wasn't much of a network for people working on faith lands. I love this term. Um, and that has changed so radically, according to her, in the past even 10 to 15 years. So I wonder if Tim and Heber could talk about that too. Have they, have they noticed this building of this meshing network of people doing work like this. Yeah, certainly I have. Um, I remember, I remember what it was like when this was might have been 2010 or so when we launched our garden at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church and I launched it during Earth Day weekend and on Earth Day Sunday. Now, you'd have to know something about the Black Baptist church tradition to know how different that was, how many, I mean, I got eyes and stares and Lord have mercy. I'm glad to su have survived the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, and it wasn't so much that that of the earth is so foreign to Black Baptist Christian congregations. Um, we've always and long been in rhythm with spirit and soil as a part of who we are and always have been, uh, which, you know, that connection and relationship did not start with slavery. Uh, uh, African uh, people, our relationship with the soil predates slavery in this country by millennia. <laughs> so there wasn't so much that was different in that kind of way but more in the face of a Earth Day Sunday as a designation day, and we're gonna launch a garden. Oh, this was really got the deacons and trustees mad. I had a worm composting workshop in the multi-purpose room right after the service, and all the children ran and played with worms in the church. Yeah, I lost support that day uh, by many in the church. But while it was strange for some, foreign and different for many at that time, since that time, so many more congregations, denominations have started. And those who had been doing it too, you know, uh, were given stage to even amplify their work even more. So definitely I've seen the growth. I love it. I love it. I, I look forward to the day when inviting a Heber Brown to come speak about, about this stuff has been like, why? Everybody's doing that. It's like, I want it to be so common that it's like not even worth even having a panel about because everybody does it. So I All definitely- All right, we just had our hope sandwich. Thank you, Heber. And I'm just gonna invite, if it feels okay to you all to put your hand on your heart and uh, let's just intend to carry forward the, uh, the love for the planet, her people, our people, each other that we felt through getting a little window on the friendship of Tim and Heber and the beautiful work they've been up to together. Let us carry forward some of this richness, this wisdom, not just to the rest of our meeting, but um, as we think about the next seven generations. And Jet, you are front and center on my screen. Thank you for being with us. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you. Jet wanted to ask you a question. What's your favorite vegetable? Tomatoes, 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 which might be a fruit, but I'm calling it a vegetable. Broccoli all day long. Heber? Um, give me, give me, give me, give me black beans. I'm gonna just pick black beans. Love Everybody growing them unmute. Up. Everybody unmute who feels like they want to name their favorite vegetable for Jet. Broccoli. Broccoli. Spinach. <laughs> Brussels sprouts. Lettuce. 
What's Thanks. yours? Um, carrots. 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 Wow. Snap peas. Snap peas. Ooh. Thank you. On that note, let us let us say goodbye. Thank you so much.